This is session um, 3A on um, the second session in the series on aging measurement and mortality modeling. Uh, I'm Renora Stryker. Uh, I'm one of the research actuaries on staff. Um, we have uh, two papers that will be presented today. We're going to, in terms of presentations, we're going um, in the order as they're presented in the, uh, in the program. Um, our first presenter will be um, Nan Huynh. Um, and uh, Nan is a, a PhD student in statistics and applied probability at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Her research interests include predictive modeling for healthcare, mortality, and insured risk applications. Among her recent publications is Using Survival Analysis to Predict Workers' Compensation Termination. That appeared in Variance in the uh, April 2018 uh, issue. And a predictive model for readmissions among Medicare patients in a California hospital, published in uh, population Health Management in November 2017. Our second presenter is uh, Pinky Wong. Uh, Pinky is um, actually employed by Zurich Financial Services, but um, the paper is when she was a student um, in the School of Risk and Actual Studies at uh, the UNSW Business School and the Center of Excellence in Population Aging Research. She has completed the combined degrees of Bachelor of Actuarial Studies and Bachelor of Commerce at, the, at UNSW, um, and that was in 2018. Her research is on mortality modeling for insurance, pensions, and financial applications, and her thesis topic of the honors degree was uh, multi-factor affine mortality models with applications to longevity risk, which um, um, have you presented on that before? I've, I think I've read, read your paper, but anyway. I did, um, Pinky is not presenting on that, right? At this, you're presenting on a different... Maybe it was Mike. That <laughs> anyway, that was a, that's also a good paper if, uh, if you're looking for good reading. Anyway, um, our third uh, presenter is um, Tom Edwalls. Uh, Tom is a clinical professor of finance at DePaul University and the executive director of the Fred Arditi Center for Risk Management at DePaul. Uh, Tom began at DePaul um, was it last year or a couple years ago? It's more than a, okay, in 2014. Um, after many years of um, uh, actuarial experience, uh, he's a recognized leader in the actual profession, currently serving on numerous uh, Society of Actuaries research committees, including the uh, Living to 100 Planning Committee. Um, uh, many, um, the, the reinsurance section, uh, research team, and am I missing some? A lot. <laughs> um, besides being a, a fellow to the Society of Actuaries and a member of the Academy, uh, he's also an associate of the Casualty Actuarial Society. So with that, um, why don't we go ahead and get started, and I'd like to introduce Nan for her presentation. Um, hello. So my name is Nian, and um, I am a graduate student from University of California in Santa Barbara. And it is a great pleasure for me to present to you my work in the Living to 100 Symposium. Um, so this is a joy work, an ongoing work with my advisor, Professor Michael Lukowski from UCSB. So here's the outline of the talk. Uh, for the first few minutes, I will um, explain the objectives of what we are trying to do and what are our main contributions. And then I will briefly introduce the method we are using. And for the remaining of the talk, I will show you some of the features in our models 
And since um, this is an ongoing research, I will talk a little bit about future direction and some potential application we can do with our framework. Um, so the goal here is to develop um, statistical framework to um, simultaneously model the mortality rates in multiple populations that share similar um, demographic characteristics. And the reason why is because the changes in mortality rates in these populations are often correlated. For example, countries in the same region or states in a country or male and female population in a country. By fitting multi-population modeling, what we want to do is to have a proper toolbox to um, examine the commonality in the longevity trends. And we want to ensure the coherence in long-term projections. So what it means is that if we observe the strong association in the mortality rates in um, different populations, and if we want to do long-term projection, then we expect to see this strong association to be continued in the future, so that it will be um, consistent with the historical data. Also, um, joint modeling provides a great opportunity to borrow data from other populations to improve the prediction quality. And we also make use of the aggregated data in joint model to reduce the uncertainty while estimating the important, the important parameters in the model. So some challenges we have, one of them is model complexity and the computational issues. So for example, if I increase the number of populations in the model, then we need to estimate more parameters. It's going to take a longer time to fit the model, and the interpretation of the parameters will be more um, complicated. Um, another challenge is data availability. We need to have data from multiple populations at hand to do joint modeling, and even when we have the data, we do need to question um, the quality of the data, the depth of the data. So in our paper, we use the data from the human mortality database, and um, we focus on retirement ages from 50 to 84 in years 1990 to 2016 from um, different European countries. And certainly, we can apply our framework to different age groups and at different time frames. So for people who work in mortality modeling, specifically in multi-population modeling, you might be well aware of Lee and Lee method, which is the benchmark in two population model. So this framework allows us to incorporate age and year into the model as factor inputs, and we can estimate the um, common trends in age and year along with the country-specific trend in age and year. We can also employ time series method for mortality projection. So the downside of this model is that we can only incorporate two populations at once and there are hundreds of parameters needed to be estimated. So what we want to do is we want to step back from the common approaches, for example, using time series methods for mortality forecast or treating age and years as factor covariates. What we want is to employ spatial statistical framework of Gaussian process regression as a machine learning method for multi-population model. So why this framework? It, is, it, prov it provides great flexibility because it fits the mortality rates as stochastic process. So it is a Bayesian approach. So what it means is that when we, when we do forecast, we don't have just the point estimate. We have a whole forecast distribution so that we can quantify the uncertainty in the predictions, and then at the same time, we can generate different scenarios for the predictions. And um, this is a non-parametric approach, meaning that we can model arbitrary function instead of having, um, having assumption on the form the function can take. 
So adapting Gaussian process regression for multi-population modeling allows us to um, estimate the cross-population dependence in the mortality rates. And at the same time, um, unlike the Lee and Lean method, we can incorporate more than two populations and the number of parameters needed to be estimated is substantially smaller. So let me quickly talk about the method. So the method is kind of similar to um, regression. So let's say that I have an input vector and for this input vector, it contains information like age, year, indicative functions to indicate which population the observation is from. And then I have the output vector, which is just log mortality rates. Okay? And then the model assumes that there is a latent function f that links the output with the input plus some noise. And we're going to treat this function as a random variable. So the way the model works is to use Bayes' theorem. So the ultimate goal here is that we want to find the likelihood of the new mortality rates given the experience data. And in order to do that, we need to specify the prior distribution over this function f that we want to estimate. Okay. And what makes Gaussian process regression works nicely is the assumption that this function f is a realization from a stochastic process. And this stochastic process is Gaussian process. In a simpler term, what it means is that any finite sample of this function is from a multivariate normal distribution. And all the properties of this function f are specified through the mean and the covariance function. So what it means is that if we want to fit this function f, is equivalent to fitting the mean function and the covariance function. So the covariance function in this model plays an important role to um, describe the similarities between any two data points. And the idea behind is very intuitive and is similar to Toppler's first law of geography that everything is related to everything else, but near things are more related than distant things. So if I translate that to our setting, what it means is if I have two data points, and if the input values of these two data points are very close, then we would expect the output values for these two data points will be close or highly correlated. And in contrast, if the input values are far apart, then the output values will be not correlated. Another example is if I know the mortality rates for age, let's say 50 in year 2010, then it will have a great um, influence on my expectation for the mortality rates for age 52 in year 2012. Okay. So in the paper, we use the square exponential kernel. So basically, it just provides a formulation to compute the covariance between two data points. And there are several important parameters in this covariance kernel. So a group of these parameters will help us estimate the cross-population correlations between two populations in the data. And then we have the parameters are known as the characteristic length scales in age and year, which controls the smoothness of the function f in the age and year dimension. So for example, if I have large values uh, for these two length scales in age and year, then the function f will be over smooth. But if I have small values in age, if I have small values um, in these two length scales, then the function f will oscillate in high frequency. So the collection of these parameters in this covariance kernel is the kernel hyperparameters. So we want to fit the model. So fitting the model is basically just to estimate the parameters in the mean and the covariance functions. And we have two approaches. So the first approach is to, to do optimization, where we want to find a set of parameters that maximize the marginal likelihood function. Okay? The second approach is the hierarchical approach, or also known as a fully Bayesian approach. 
So what we have to do is before fitting the model, we need to specify the prior distributions for all the parameters in the model. So what it means is that at the end of the day, instead of having only one parameter, so each parameter now will have a distribution so that we have a collection of models that are consistent with the data. So compared to the MLE method, it is computational more intensive. Um, it's com computational more intensive, but it quantifies the model risk. Okay. So let me show you some features in our models. So as I stated earlier, that we can incorporate more than two populations in our model. So let's say I have a joint model for male observations from four European countries. Okay, so after I fit the model, then I will see the estimated parameters in the mean and the covariance function. So the mean function in our model, it describes the trend in log mortality rates for all four populations in the model. Okay? And the way we interpret the parameters in this mean function is similar to regression framework. And then we have the covariance function. So there's two important things that we can take away from the covariance function. The first thing is we can see the share values in length scale for each and year across all four populations. And let me remind you that these length scales controls the smoothness of your um, mortality surface. Okay? And we can also estimate the cross-population correlation. So for example, you can see based on the correlation matrix here that Denmark is more correlated with UK and less correlated with France and Sweden. Okay? So um, in our model, since we, we use aggregated data, so what it means is that we can reduce the uncertainty in estimating the parameters. And at the same time, um, the, more pop the more populations added into the model, the closer we get at discovering the commonality in the longevity trends. So, um, so here's an example. So I have two figures. Okay, so for these figures, I show the distributions of the length scale in age and year. So the one, um, and then, so the y-axis is the credible bands, and the x-axis is just different models. And if I move from the left to the right of the, of the x-axis, then the number of the populations increases. So for example, the first four models are the models with only one single population. And then the next six models are models with two populations from all four countries, Denmark, France, Sweden, and UK. And then the last model is the JOY model when we fit all four populations together. Okay? And then if we move along the x-axis, you can see that the credible bands of the parameters get narrower. So this again implies that JOY model provides tighter hyperparameter posteriors to reduce the model risk. So in these two figures, we also have the dashed horizontal lines that crossing the credible bands. So these two horizontal lines are the average of the length scales taken from the pop population with all four um, countries. And since it's crossing all, or it's intersect with a majority of the credible bands, this imply that there is indeed a common values in length scale in age and year shared by these four populations. We also see that um, the JOY model will improve the prediction quality in terms of having more accurate um, our sample predictions. And at the same time, it reduces the uncertainty in the prediction. So to assess the model's prediction accuracy, we use the symmetric version of the mean absolute percentage error, or SMIP. And to estimate the uncertainty in the prediction, we just estimate the, the variance or the standard errors of the prediction. So I have two examples. So for the table on the left, it basically just compares the SMIP values for the JOY model between Denmark and Sweden compared to SMIP values for single populations fitted separately for Denmark and Sweden. And you see that the SMIP values in JOY mo models are smaller than the single population models. 
Okay, and similarly, the, for the table on the right, I have the standard errors of the prediction for the, for the forecast for Sweden using joy model and single population model. And since the numbers um, in the joy models are smaller, then let's just indicate that we have smaller errors um, in prediction uh, from the joy model. So the next feature is the coherence forecast. So if we fit the mortality model for each population separately, then we assume that the mortality rates for these populations are independent. And that can lead to the divergence in long-term forecast. So what do I mean by that? So I have an illustration. So I have two heat maps. So each heat map is the differences in log mortality rates for male and female observations in Denmark. But the one on the left, the differences are computed using two single population models. And the one on the right, the differences computed using a Choi model. Okay? All the models here are, um, are, are fitted using data from 1990 to 2016, and then we do long-term forecast up to 2060. So if we look at the heat map on the left, then it suggests that by 2030, then the differences will be negative. Or what it means is that male observations will have lower mortality rates than female observations and that are not consistent with what we see in our training data. On the other hand, we have the heat map on the right. The differences converges to a positive value, and that positive value ensures that male observations will have higher mortality rates than female's observations, and that value is the average differences in log mortality rates between these two populations in the training set. So another example here is we fit a JOY model for male observations in four countries, Denmark, Sweden, France, and UK. And then we use this model to predict the log mortality rates and the improvement rate factors for age 70 in the long term. And not just stopping at predicting log mortality rates and the improvement rate, we also generate different scenarios. Okay. And we see that within each scenario, the mortality rates and the improvement rate factors, um, they all move in the same direction at the same rate across the populations. So this, um, this means that our model is, um, is, is very flexible in terms of we can generate different scenarios. And also within each scenario, it ensures the coherence feature. Okay. And the last feature is to, um, by um, fitting, by using a multi-population model, uh, it provides great opportunity to borrow the latest information from other populations to improve the prediction about the recent domestic mortality for, our, for a population of interest. And this is incredibly useful, especially when we use data from um, um, the HMD, where the data from different countries arrives non-synchronously. And um, I want to have a quick note that it's not always guaranteed that joint models will have better prediction quality over single models. Okay? We only see the significant improvement of joint model over single model if there's a high correlation between the population of interest and other populations in the model. Or we, we only see the improvement if the information added into the model is closely relevant to the model, to, to the population of interest. Okay. And then for the next step, um, so right now we are trying to work on clustering method. So we want to see if we can identify populations that share great similarities to add into joint models instead of like selecting them randomly uh, for model fitting. 
and also we are we are interested in research in um, to speed up computation so that we can handle larger data sets. For example, I want to add more populations in the model, or I want to um, uh, I want to model a larger age groups and like longer time periods. Um, and we also want to like investigate other covariance kernel. And for future direction, we are very interested in implementing our framework to model the mortality rates from um, 50 states in the US and potentially model the cause of death mortality. Thank you. Um, hi everyone, thank you for coming to this section and today in this presentation I'm going to talk about how a fine process will be applied in modeling cohort mortality risk. So due to recent mortality improvement, mortality model research has attracted great attention, especially the discrete time mortality models. So, um, for example, Lee Carter model is one of the most famous um, discrete time model, and this type of model mainly focuses on uh, how the trends of mortality improvements and the impact of uncertainty of mortality. Some of these models also incorporate the cohort effects. Another type of the, um, mortality model is the continuous time affine cohort mortality models. And due to the need to manage longevity risk, this type of model also become popular in recent research. So some of this type of model only consider the evolution of mortality intensity within single cohort, and some models will consider the force of mortality across multiple cohorts. So why we would like to choose um, continuous time affine mortality models? One of the benefits of this type of model is that it has analytical tractability, which means we can derive codes from solutions to the survival curves. And this type of model is also consistent. It means that it can, um, the functional form of survival probabilities will maintain across time, and it will also provide stable parameter estimates. As um, this type of model is developed based on trend structure model, financial market participants will find this type of model familiar. And based on the structure of a fine model, it is easy and natural to extend to multi-factor models to capture different trends, volatility, and correlation by age. And with multi uh, arbitrage free formulations, it is easy for us to use this type of model to calibrate the price of longevity risk. So, Today in this presentation, I will introduce uh, different types of continuous time affine mortality model, including their survival probability solutions, mortality dynamics. Uh, it's in particular, I will talk about a model called arbitrage-free nelson Siegel model, which has factors that is level, slope, and curvature. And we will fit this model to age cohort data. We will estimate this model by using common filter and this is how the Poisson variation will be captured and we will compare the model performance by using in-sample analysis and out-of-sample prediction. So to start with, um, as our continuous time affine mortality model is uh, based on term structure models in credit risk models, so we would have developed a concept or a term that is equivalent to the U2 maturity in zero coupon bond, and we call it as average force of mortality, and notations in credit risk literature can be also applied similarly in mortality modeling. So survival probability in um, continuous time model is defined as um, at co that a cohort at age X at time t survive a duration of capital T minus t will be this formula. 
and with of factors that have three factor. So it, it will be a exponential function of a fine function of the x. X will be the factors that are driving uh, mortality rates, and um, which is similar to a stochastic parameters that are affecting the mortality curve. And B here is the factor loading. This to describe the impact of different factors on our mortality curves at different ages. With our survival probability, we are easier to um, define average force mortality, which is equivalent to uterine maturity, as I mentioned. And B here is factor loading. A is the adjustment factor for our survival curve. So one of the examples of continuous child mortality model is developed by Blackburn and Sherry in 2030. And it has this form of um, factor loading and adjustment factor. Um, the delta and sigma are to be estimated. Also, one of the most important uh, term structure model, Nelson Siegel model, can be developed to have a form of um, mortality model. So, the equivalent form of Nelson Siegel model um, has been developed with arbitrage free dynamic implementation. So, for example, we have independent affine uh, arbitrage free Nelson Siegel model here. The B um, average, the factor, factor loading is um, in this form with different uh, adjustment factor. You may note, um, you guys may notice that the factor loading in this model is quite different from the Blackburn and Sherry's model we see before. This is because um, with this specific factor loading form, we can interpret the three factors in this AF and NS model as level, slope, and curvature. And the A adjustment term here is to ensure our model to be arbitrage free. So, um, to manage lo price longevity risk, we will have a price um, of, we have a Q measure, risk neutral measure. So the risk neutral measure is defined using a longevity zero coupon bond. So let P bar to be the price of longevity zero coupon bond. Uh, here is the interest rate with mu as the mortality rate. By assuming the dependent between interest rate and mortality, this um, zero um, longevity bond can be written as the price of normal zero coupon bond and survival probabilities under um, Q measure. So with um, this, we can easily define the derived survival probabilities and mortality rates under Q measure. The methodology of uh, term structure modeling can also be applied in calculating survival probabilities for pricing. So I have introduced two examples of affine mortality models, and here is the general framework for the um, affine mortality model. So X is the latent factors that are driving the mortality rate. It follows uh, the following stochastic differential equations. So K here is the mean reversion matrix. Theta is the long-term mean, which we usually assume it to be zero. Sigma is the volatility matrix, and W is the standard deviation. The matrix here is a diagonal matrix with these um, diagonal entries. This is a continuous time equivalent of autoregressive processes for factors. Under these uh, dynamics, we can develop um, survival probabilities under Q measure, and we can see that it is also an exponential function of a fine function of sec, um, x factors. So the B factor loading, A adjustment term will follow the following ordinary differential equation with the zero boundary conditions. So it, within this um, affine mortality framework, two types of mortality framework, um, models have been developed. The first one is to have all the factors following Gaussian process. With Gaussian process, there is a probability of negative mortality rate. However, this type of model is readily to be estimated with carbon filters. It is easy to simulate it, and we have proved that um, in practice, it is a very low probability of negative mortality rates. 
we have also um, developed another type of mortality model with all the factors following square root processes, and which also known as the CIR processes. With our CIR process, um, this model is easy to, easier to capture the heterogeneity in population, which is the differences among individuals. So with heterogeneity, um, the, dis the mortality will tend to follow gamma distribution instead of Gaussian distribution. And we can avoid the probability of negative mortality with CIR processes. One of the drawbacks of this type of model is that it is uh, difficult to estimate with common filter. So to calibrate um, the model to historical data, which is the real world measure, P measure, we'll need a link between the risk neutral measure and the real world measure, which is the um, risk premium. We have assumed and essentially a farm form for the risk premium. The first one um, for, is for the Gaussian process, the second one for the CIR process. And the D has been defined in the general framework in mortality dynamics. With this essentially a fine form of risk premium, the dynamics of mortality, the XT, will be the same as the one under P me uh, Q measure and P measure. So this is the models that I would like to talk, uh, introduce today. The first four will be Gaussian process model. The first one is from Blackburn and Sherry's paper in 2013, we'll have, which have independent factors. The second one is the independent AFNS model. The third, in the third and fourth one, I will introduce uh, dependency between factors in the Blackburn and Sherry's model and in the AFNS model. The final model will be the CIR model that has all the factors following square root processes. So to um, estimate all these models, we would like to use common filters. Uh, it had a measurement equation to capture the effects of Poisson variation. So this measurement equation is to be defined based on the average force of mortality. And also because mortality rate curve change stochastically driven by the factors with chain and uncertainty. We need to have a state transition for the factor dynamics. We then filter the value with historical data. And with historical data, we can calculate, the, um, we can construct the likelihood function and numerically select a set of matter parameters to maximize the likelihood function. So this is, um, in mortality data, normally what we, when we are um, trying to fit the model to data, we will use age period data, which is the graph we show here is the US mortality data from 1933 to 2015 at age 50 to 100. So when we require cohort mortality rates in practice, what we do is just use age period models to forecast age period survival curves and read the curve diagonally to get the cohort mortality rates. However, with um, cohort mortality model, we can fit it directly to the age cohort data. This graph is the age cohort data for US population cohorts that are born in 19, 1883 to 1985. So we can see that after 1915, the data is incomplete because we haven't observed the um, depths after um, that cohort year, but we have complete data for the cohorts born before 1915. So we have fit all of our models to this complete data set, which is the um, cohort that born from 1883 to 1915. So we use the mortality data of US from human mortality database. And to obtain the historical data, we first calculate the survival probabilities. And based on the definition of average force of mortality, we also calculate the historical average force of mortality. So this um, table here shows the results of all of, of our models fitted to age cohort data. We can see that the CIR model has outperformed all of the other models. It has the highest likelihood AIC and BIC. 
we think, however, within the Gaussian uh, models, um, AFNS model uh, perform relatively well, but the dependent vector black Shares model has a higher likelihood AIC and BIC. This graph here is that we have fitted independent black and Sherry's model to our age period data, data, which is the normal practice when we, how we estimate our model. So factor one, X1, is quite stable and constant across all the years. And for factor two and factor three, they are stable until 1970. And after 1970, X2 has dropped and X3 has increased. It means that there must be, there would be a structural change around 1970, which is the mortality improvement. And this graph, we have our factor loadings, which are the, fact, the parameters that are, depends how factors affect mortality rates. So with B1 and B2 uh, increasing, it means the first two factors affect older ages more than the younger ages. So given we have in decreasing X2, it means um, X2 also contributed to the mortality improvement at older ages. For B3, it would be a decreasing curve. It means X3, factor 3, has affected younger ages more than older ages. And we have fitted our new mortality model, the independent AFNS model to age cohort data. Um, all of the three factors are quite stable until 1900. Um, after 1900, the level factor increased, whereas the level factor decreased, and they correspond to each other. Um, the curvature factors means that this factor affects the middle age more, which is the age 60 to age 80, than younger ages and older ages. Similarly, we have our factor loadings here. So um, it mean B1 means level factor of at old age with the same impact. With increasing B2, we have let slow factor increase, um, slow factor of at older ages more than younger ages. For B3 uh, factor loading, the values are all decrease, are all negative, and it is decreasing. So it means um, there is a mortality improvement at older ages for recent cohorts. So, and adjusting the A here means adjustment term. So, with a negative adjustment term and decreasing, it means older ages need more adjustment than younger ages because older ages are relatively more volatile than the younger ages. So, here we have shown um, all the residuals by comparing the projected um, average force of mortality and the historical one. All of the graphs are at, at the same scale, except for our graph A. So graph A is the independent black Ben shares model. It suggested that it has the, it has the largest residuals. So, and also by comparing graph B and graph A, we can see with factor dependency, we have actually improved the uh, model fit of this model family. And by comparing um, C and D, okay, we can see that this is not the case for AF and S model. Also, by looking at the independent Black and Sherry's model and the AF and S model, which is graph A and C, we can see um, the structure of AS and S model, which is the level slope curvature factor, has improved the ensemble model fit. And despite all of that, we have found that the CIR model has outperformed all the other or other models. And we can also see a hump here across all the graphs because the structural change in 1970. And this is the um, percentage error of all the Gaussian, Gaussian models. So um, we can see the independent Blab and Sherry's model perform relatively bad at older ages. Others perform similarly. And we have compared the better perform model, which is the independent AFNS model and dependent Blab and Sherry's model with the CIR model. 
um, at older ages, we found that the AFNS model and CR model have better in-sample fit. So to, um, as we use this model to forecast survival probabilities, we also need to assess the out-of-sample performance. So before we do the um, assessment, we have to calculate the focus of average force, average force mortality by using conditional mean of the factors. And then we can calculate the survival probabilities expectation. So this is the conditional mean for all the models. And here we compare the forecast performance for the five models. So we can see all those CR model has a very good in-sample fit. The sample, uh, forecast performance is not that good, but um, AFNS model has performed really um, well. And on the graph on the left side has grafted the actual survival probabilities and all the projective um, survival probabilities. We can see the independent Blackburn and Shares model underestimated and the CIR model, model also underestimated. On the right hand side, we can see um, the percentage error of all these projected survival curves. We, um, the independent AFNS model has um, the lowest percentage rate. So we can conclude that the independent AFNS model has good in sample performance and also the predictive uh, performance. So to wrap up, we have introduced a uh, continuous time mortality rate, especially the AFNS model, which has level, slope, and curvature factors. We have outlined the dynamics of mortality rates and the closed form solution of survival probabilities. We have talked about how we estimate the um, parameters using common filter and also how to capture Poisson variation. So uh, our empirical results suggest that this uh, independent factor AFNS model is parsimonious and it is able to capture the variation in cohort and has good in sample fit and predictive performance. It is easy to implement with a close form solution of survival probabilities and we are able to interpret the factors as level, slope and curvature factors and as all the other affine mortality models. This multi-factor model is um, easy to use in financial and insurance applications. In future research, we would like to use the incomplete data, cohort data that I just showed in estimation to better capture the Poisson variation and age dependence. And for CR model, we would like to use uh, improve its estimation process and also the forecasting process. Thank you, that's all. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, let's try again. All right. All right. So it is. Uh, it's my pleasure to um, uh, discuss these these two excellent papers. And um, let me start by just saying that for me. My favorite part of, you know, Renora mentioned I'm on the planning committee for this conference. My favorite part is that I get to read these like, papers that, not just that I get to, but I force myself to, because uh, I, these are papers that I, you know, would, would just looking at the abstract say, oh yes, I'd like to know that, uh, but I know that if, if, if it were entirely up to me, I'd never get around to it. So when I have to discuss them, that means I have to read them. So, um, so I, I, I do enjoy that. And um, these, were, these were mathematically challenging papers. I know for me, I, I take great pride in being able to keep up with all, the, with all the math developments, but I was kind of out of breath after reading both of these papers. Uh, so you've done a wonderful job, both of you. Um, I'm going to talk about them separately because they kind of go in, in different directions. Um, but I, I wanted to uh, take advantage of the fact that I've got the soapbox for a minute to uh, just make a comment about longevity risk. And I, I, I think it was in your paper where you start with um, defining longevity risk as the 
risk of misestimation of mortality improvement trend. Um, and uh, I like to distinguish between individual longevity risk and aggregate longevity risk. If there wasn't such a thing as individual longevity risk, you wouldn't have annuities and pensions. People don't know how long they're going to live, and that creates a risk for how do they manage their assets after they're no longer um, wage earners. So um, th that's the genesis of all longevity risk. The, um, the aggregate longevity risk is the fact that uh, the, so, so individual longevity risk is an insurable risk. I mean, it's ag when you aggregate it, you reduce the risk substantially due to the law of large numbers. Uh, the thing is to have an insurance work perfectly, the risk should be uncorrelated, or at least approximately uncorrelated, and mortality improvement trend is a correlation between all the people that are exposed to individual longevity risk. So that's aggregate longevity risk, and it's, it's, it's important to measure, and it's worth measuring, but I just, I just like to point out there's, there's two kinds of longevity risk, and, and as actuaries, we need to be uh, sensitive to both of them. All right, so um, starting with the affine mortality models. Now, I, I wanted to start by putting an equation up here that I understand, okay? Because, <laughs> uh, you know, going, going through all, all the uh, um, stochastic differential equations in, in the paper, was, you know, kind of like, uh, I think that's right. Um, <clears throat> but it's getting back to this, you know, fundamental definition of uh, continuous annuity. So <clears throat> continuous annuity, uh, this I think is out of Jordan. I don't know if they use the same equation in the other texts since then, but uh, you just uh, if you measure the force of mortality with mu and the force of interest with, with delta, uh, you just integrate the exponentiation of, of minus those things over time, and that's your, your present value of your continuous annuity. So um, where, where this paper is kind of uh, starting from is, you know, when we look at, especially look, for me, I learned from Jordan, and it kind of made the assumption that interest is constant and that the uh, force of mortality is a known function, and neither of those are true. I mean, both, um, both the force of mortality and the interest rate are complex stochastic processes, and um, there's been a lot of work done on stochastic modeling of, of interest rates. Uh, what one of the things this paper is doing is um, is bringing in some of the techniques from uh, stochastic interest rate modeling into modeling the stochastic mortality rates. So we do need to measure both the mortality and the interest rate risk to, to capture the risk of the valuation of these annuities and all uh, longevity type products. Um, so the the um, the model that was focused on in the paper is this arbitrage-free Nelson-Siegel model, um, at which is a continuous time force of mortality model. And so um, the big advantage here, first of all, there's a closed form with, with components for level, slope, and curvature. So you can, that sort of, that part sort of intuitively makes sense, but um, when I looked at that term that makes it arbitrage-free, I'm like, I'll take your word for it. <laughs> it just didn't, I didn't look at that and say, oh, yes, of course, that's what that, what, what should make it arbitrage free. So that part was a, a little bit challenging. Um, but getting a closed form is, is always a, an accomplishment, particularly when you're doing a, a stochastic process. So I, I congratulate you on that. Um, and the, the other advantage here is that you're getting sort of a, a consistent approach to modeling both the mortality and the interest rate risk. So when we're trying to uh, to estimate the um, longevity risk in terms of the valuation of of longevity products, having that consistency gives you a, a good basis for for modeling that risk. Um, and this this particular this AFNS model is kind of the winner in the paper on the out of sample forecasting based on um, the uh, symmetric um, uh, mean average of the uh, percentage error, um, mean absolute percentage error. Um, 
which you know the CIR model did well for fitting the historical data, but not quite as good on the out of sample forecasting, which is always nice. So um, it's also it's a cohort mortality model, which I like because uh, my my belief is that um, mortality sort of evolves across a cohort, you know, so that you're going to get a lot of similarity from just a, a generation that all have the same uh, types of experiences and, and medical care and, and technology as progress through the age spectrum than, than others that are not quite the same. So, um, so, so that's why I, I like it. And I think that in particular when we're looking at valuing uh, annuities and pension obligations, things like that, we are looking at a cohort. I mean, if you, if you are writing annuity business, you can decide you're going to stop writing it, which is fine, uh, but you'll have those policies on the books for the, whatever cohort you wrote, and they're going to be with you for as long as that cohort continues to, uh, um, to evolve. Um, so a uh, big disadvantage of a cohort mortality model is that complete cohorts are from a long time ago. You know, so in this particular case, we use the data from cohorts up to 1915. Um, and I've actually done a, a uh, I've been very interested in cohort mortality models. I, I see my friends, the Gavrilovs from the back here, <laughs> where we, we've looked at specifically U.S. cohorts right around the year 1900 b because of the fact that you can extract information from a complete cohort, which is great. But that means that in, um, in checking how good these, these were and, and comparing the predictive uh, ability of the models, they use the 1916 cohort as the one to predict which is nice, but I mean, I think for those of us who are measuring pension obligations, we'd kind of like to know about the 1950 cohort or 1960 cohort or something around there. So it's, there's a lot of years difference and, and it raises a question, well, will it still work that well when we move into more recent cohorts that are, are of more immediate importance in, uh, in, in valuing the obligations? All right, so, um, with for Jan's paper, I, I got excited about this paper because I was looking at uh, this, you know, multi-population modeling, saying, "Oh, can I think of ways we could use this for insurance?" So um, I got a real excited one. First of all, the, the example, the illustration of male versus female mortality, it's like this is great. Actually, uh, we'll, we'll get back to that in a minute. But but clearly, it can do that because they did it in the paper. Uh, I was thinking you could also use it for preferred versus standard mortality, or even multi-level preferred, um, when you've got those populations. You can use it for company mortality experience versus industry, um, uh, or even insured mortality versus population mortality. So you know, any one of those types of definitions, uh, so in, in the paper they're using the um, uh, populations to be a nation's population. but it wouldn't have to be. It could be, you know, any kind of a subdivision of data that gives you these two distinct populations that are somehow related. So, so I thought that was very exciting. Um, then in, in determining how much influence the two or more populations have on each other, there's this length scale parameter um, that kind of, uh, as she pointed out, if that's, if it's a, uh, a big number that makes the uh, the two population mortality very close, uh, and if it's a small number, it means they're going to fluctuate um, a lot more independently. But that kind of is is driving what's um, uh, how, how close, close these two are going to operate, operate together. together. Um, um, now here's, here's where I want to go to, to the, the slide. Let me, let me see if, if I can if I can, if I can pull, pull up your, your, your slide. slide here, cause cause I tried. I, tried, I, actually, I actually tried to, try to copy, copy it. And then then I'm, I'm in PowerPoint. PowerPoint. She's, She's in, in, in PDF, PDF, and, and, and it, it, it would well. Well. So, so um, let me uh, briefly end, end my show and, and get, get back, back to this, this one, one. See, see if, if I, I can, can find it. it. Shouldn't be too far, far back, back here. here. Here we, here go. we go. Right, right here. here. Um, so, so this this particular graph sold me on this paper. 
it also, it also reminded, reminded me that, that recreational, recreational marijuana, marijuana use is now legal in Illinois. Illinois. <laughs> But, but although I, I, had, I had to look, look at, at it twice, twice because, because um, you know, you know she said that this, this shows how, how in the one, one case you have, have a cross on the other, you don't. I'm like, well, well, that graph on the right is right almost all blue, blue and then I realized that on the scale, scale. Uh, the, 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 the one, one on the left, the, the, the scale goes uh, plus and minus. minus. So, um, so the, the, the blue means that the males are actually. Uh, lower, lower mortality, mortality than, than, than the females, and, and, and the oranges and reds are where uh, male, male mortality, mortality is higher. Well, in well, the, the other graph, graph it's, it's a positive. positive. So, so everywhere on that graph, male mortality is higher. higher. This, this is, is so, so looking, looking at, the at the scale, you can see this keeps, keeps the, the those, that differential um, where you where want you it want to be. to be. Uh, as a positive difference between male and female mortality. So, so I'll get, get back to my, my slides, slides if I can. can. Yeah, yeah, so, so uh, I, I, I worked on the development of the 2015 DBT, um, and, and we, we, um, we, had we had what we called, called um, um, a heuristic, heuristic monotonicity uh, constraints. constraints. Where, for, for example, example uh, you know, you know everywhere, everywhere in the data, data um, Female, female mortality, mortality is better, better than, than male, male mortality. mortality. But when, but when we, start we start applying mortality, mortality improvement, improvement factors, factors and things, things like that, that we, start we start to get crossovers. crossovers right? Right? We, can't, we, can't, we can't justify a crossover, crossover in our table based on data that doesn't, doesn't exist. exist. So, so we, we did, did a lot of manual, manual adjustments, adjustments to make sure rates that weren't, that weren't supposed to cross over didn't cross over. Had the same issue with some of the smoke or non-smoker under under various mortality improvement scenarios. So I was thinking, well, this would have been nice to have when we were doing that table, so we could just put in a model and not have to worry about did the rates cross over. But then, of course, you know, you get to the disclaimers in the paper, like I was all excited. But they point out how it's computationally expensive. Uh, and um, actually, actually suggested, suggested a limit, limit of five, five populations. Other things I just rattled off can get you a whole lot more than five in a big hurry. hurry. And, um, and, and the, so, so I, I, let me know if I'm wrong about that. But, but when you're actually showing the models that were uh, uh, fit that did the uh, prediction, those, those were actually fit on ages 70 before, before, not the whole. Yeah, so, you know, they kind of. Trim the, the data, data set, set down, down to size, size which, which, which I totally, totally understand because you had to make sure the model converged before, before you got here. <laughs> but, but um, so that so was, that was, was kind of a big disappointment. Like, like, you know, you know I, 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 I can think, think of all these things that they could do, and theoretically they can. But if it will take, you know, a month for it to converge, maybe that's not all that practical. And the other thing that was mentioned in the paper is about. Um, the, the covariant covari stationarity constraint, where, where, where I believe we, the, the suggestion, suggestion was measure uh, uh, fit your model, model over limited age ranges, ranges so that you don't have, have to have so much, much uh, influence. That. So, so, so I guess the part of my question is, is that, 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 that um, the, fact the fact that the relationship between uh, ages, ages that are the same number of years apart was. Should, should be the same, same as part, part of your covariance stationary, stationary requirement. requirement. Does, that Does that sort of implicitly imply, imply a Gompertz curve, curve underneath? underneath? Or, 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 or making? Make You're, You're not sure? sure? Okay. Mm -hmm. just, just, that was just, just okay. okay for, for, I mean, obviously, if the, the ratio was constrained, constrained you didn't say the ratio was a covariance constraint, but if it was a ratio was constrained, that would imply a Gompertz model. All right, so that's that's my contribution today. Uh, I, do I do want to thank, thank these authors, authors and think they, they did a very fine job. job. And I, I, I think these papers, papers are, are good contributions to the literature. I, I, I certainly uh, uh, would like to start implementing um, some, some of these things, things in, in, in the work, work that, that, that I've been, been doing. doing so. So. Thank, thank you very, you very much. much. We have, we have some, some time, time for, for comments, comments or questions. questions. If, anyone if anyone has any, any just go to, go to the, the microphone. microphone. Anyone? anyone? Yep, yep. 
Yeah. yeah. And could you, could state, you state your name, name please? please? Oh, oh okay. okay. I'm, I'm Xiaoming Liu, Liu from, from Western, Western University. University. So, so yeah. yeah, what else? else? <laughs> about about me. I, I think it's, it's more about, about the work, work here. here. And um, um, I, do I do appreciate, appreciate two young, young researchers, researchers present uh, their, their um, excellent work. work. And, and so, so I, I, I think I, I want, want to make, make some, some comments, comments maybe, maybe the, the questions. questions. <laughs> I'm, not <laughs> I'm not sure. sure. <laughs> so basically, I think I, I have also, also worked on those models, models as well. well. So, so when, when is the multi-population? Uh, models. models. Another, Another is, is the uh, uh, I find I models, models uh, multi-dimensional. Multi so, so I think, think those, those models, models are really, really complicated to work through. through. So, so it's, it's not, not easy. easy. But, um, uh, uh, but, but on, on the other, other hand, hand so, so I think, I think um, um, so, so you, you look, look for some, some nice properties. properties. Out from, from those, those models. Model. So, so, like, like uh, you, you discuss, discuss for uh, multi population models, models, then you, you are, are able, able to generate, to generate uh, reasonable male, male and, and the female, female differences. differences. So, that's, so that's a nice, a nice property you are, you are able, able to achieve. And, and the, the other, other one? one? I, mean, I forgot. I forgot. Oh, oh, yeah, you have, have the age cohort um, model, so, so then there are also some nice properties in, in terms, terms of number. number. So, so now, now it comes, comes my comments and the questions. questions. So, so although, although um, um, ideologically, those, those numbers number make sense to some, some main principles. principles. Um, am I right? right? But, but I, I really, really appreciate if you, you can have more interpretation about those numerical results. results. So, so other than, than like, like um, male, male and the female, female gaps, gaps generally, generally make sense. sense. They, are they are all positive, positive or, or you know, you know some, some consistency between ages. If, if you, you can, can dig into the, the actual. Uh, um, future mortality trends and I'm being, being able, able to uh, connect, connect uh, those, those predicted future mortality uh, uh, rates with some factual evidence. It, it can, can help pe uh, people who use those model results have more confidence about the prediction. So, so, am I, I <laughs> clear about? Yeah, yeah so, so it's it just, just like, like a number, number wise, there are some, some nice properties. Property. But, but in, in terms, terms of, of actual, actual mortality trend, if um, um, the model can, can help audience understand more about those numerical results, I think, I think it, it will be, be very helpful. helpful. So, so I, I didn't, didn't get that, that from, from the presentation. presentation. So, so that's, that's my, my comments. comments. But, but if, if you, you can respond to that, I would I appreciate it. So, so it's, it's also, also a question. question. Yeah, any, any comments, comments from, from the two of you? you? Someone, Someone want to go, go first? first? Uh, Pinky? Yeah. We have, have sir, sorry, one, one of, of the, the I think the drawbacks of my work is that we didn't do much on the forecasting. forecasting. As, As you mentioned, mentioned with more robust results, results we, we only did one, one cohort, cohort forecast, and it is only using the best estimate. estimate. So, so what, what we have looked look is, in the future, future to do it is to do simulations to have more uh, stronger, stronger evidence, evidence to suggest our model has, has better, better results than the others. others. And, and we, we also would like, to, as I mentioned, would like to use the incomplete cohort model to do more recent cohort forecasting in the future research. So um, um, I think maybe it would be good to put in a paper saying that on um, how the result looks like or how we interpret our uh, forecasts. Because I, 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 I agree, agree with you that, that we just, just did one cohort forecast, forecast which is not a strong evidence. evidence. So, so thank, thank you so, so much, much for your comments. Okay, 
so I'm not really clear on your question, but my comment is like at least for our model, um, we are able to generate different scenarios. And um, so let me. So, so, for example, for example you, can you can see on the, the, on the two, two figures. figures. So, so by, by fitting a joy model uh, for, for the four population, population Denmark, Denmark, Sweden, Sweden France, France, and UK. So, so let's, let's say that, that I assume that... Um, so, um, um, my, so, so I guess, I guess my, my take is that, that um, on, on the right-hand right side, side, you can, can see, see the model does provide insight on the improvement factors in the long term. For example, um, we have, if we fit the mean function, assuming that there's no year trend in the data, then like if I do long term forecast, then the model suggests that the improvement rate for these four populations will converge to um, 1%, sorry, 2%. And then, and then if, if that, that is, is too high, high I, 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 can I can also, also adjust, adjust the improvement, improvement rate factors, factors to make, to make it, it like 1%. 1%. Okay. So, so I, Thank you. So I, I think, think uh, my question is more, more um, um, what, what support you, you to make, make those, those adjustments? adjustments? And, and then how those adjustments make sense? sense. Um, in, terms in terms of the people, of the people who use, use those models. Model. So, so it's, it's really, really not, not about, about how you can mani manipulate those outcomes. Outcome. It's, it's more which uh, makes make sense in, in terms, terms of, of uh, you know, you know, actual evidence, evidence to suggest those, those should be future, future trends. trends. Yeah. yeah, so, so um, yeah. Um, I think that, that um, there's only, only so much you can, you can do for long-term long forecast. I am yes. yeah. like, like 20 years or like 40 years forecast. So uh, right. Right. Usually, usually in practice, I think people do use their expert knowledge to generate the right scenarios. Uh, well, not, not the right, the right scenario, but the scenarios <laughs> that they think are exactly. suitable. Right. Right. right, so, 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 so my, my comment is like from this morning there is a session to talk about mortality improvement for uh, uh, rich people, mortality improves, but for, but for lower profile, profile people, people their um, mortality rate is actually not Im improving. improving. So, so if, if the model, model always, um, if, if, if this model suggests um, um, Convergence, convergence is a, is a good, good feature, feature but, but that, that may, may not be justified by the actual mortality trend change. change. So, so uh, what, what I'm, I'm asking is more like, like uh, the model feature be justified by actual mortality change evidence, evidence or, or those, those kind, kind of things. things. So, so I'm not, um, uh, so, so I'm more, more suggesting for, for, for model who do, do those, those kind of research, try to be connected, connected with um, the, reality, the reality with, with uh, yeah. yeah. So, so, so again, again, I appreciate, I appreciate for seeing your, your work. work. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for your <laughs> comment. Well, I well, want to thank, thank you for, for attending, attending uh, the, the session. session. Let's, Let's give, give our, our presenters, presenters another, another round of applause, applause please. please.